Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just uh, give it about a minute or two to make sure that everyone has joined the session um, properly, and then we'll get started. Okay, I think everyone's had a chance to join. Well, we just wanted to say um, welcome to the Firefighter Cancer Initiative seminar series. I know it's a little a bit into January already, but we wanted to wish everyone a happy new year if we haven't seen you yet in 2021. Um, and uh, just a quick reminder um, that if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please add um, those questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, so you can type it at any time during the presentation and then we'll take the questions at the end. The presenters will take the questions. We have with us today, um, this morning, two of our PIs for the Firefighter Cancer Initiative, Dr. Alberto Caban Martinez and Dr. Natasha Schaefer Sali. And Dr. Caban will be presenting, um, will be introducing the presentation today. So thank you, Cynthia, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, it's a happy new year to those of us that are joining for the first time on our seminar series in the new year. Um, it's my distinct uh, privilege and pleasure to introduce um, one of our uh, doctoral students, uh, Ms. Hannah Kling, who is um, currently in her second year of the doctoral program in prevention science and community health. So she's going to be talking to us about a really important project that traverses all aspects of firefighter health and safety. As you know, we have a dedicated um, research program here at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center that tries to understand what are the risk factors for cancer in the fire service and how we can prevent them from even occurring in the first place. Part of health and safety and often an overlooked concept is well-being and how do we think about um, uh, protecting the, the uh, physical, mental and overall well-being of our firefighters. So as epidemiologists, we like to always figure out how do we define it and how do we measure it um, from the perspective of the population that we're working with. And so Hannah has um, been brave in uh, saying that she wants to take on this torch of understanding um, well-being, uh, not only because she's passionate about firefighters, but will be marrying one in the next three months and really wants to make sure she keeps the health of her husband um, really healthy. Um, so we'll be happy to entertain questions at the end. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, please feel free to pop them into the chat on the corner or um, we'll entertain them towards the end. But without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming um, Hannah as she defines and operationalizes for us the concept of well-being for firefighters. And over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. I feel like I don't even need to introduce, introduce myself after all of this. Uh, once again, my name is Hannah Kling and I'm a PhD student in prevention science and community health. And I work under the great mentorship of Dr. Caban Martinez and his occupational health and safety lab. And today I'll be talking to you about this up and coming study that we'll be doing this, um, this spring on defining and operationalizing the well being of firefighters and emergency medical services, those are referred to as EMS workers, using a total worker health approach. So um, traditional occupational health and safety protection programs have primarily concentrated on ensuring that work is safe and that workers are protected from the harms that arise from work itself. So in the left-hand picture, you can see here a construction worker that has you know, a hard hat helmet on, hearing protection, eye protection is being clipped in, all of these because his job um, puts him at harm's risk for you know, all these different adverse health effects. But now we know that workers, just like firefighters, face not only the traditional risks of chemical, physical, and biological hazards, but are also at increased risks related to the changing nature of work. And we know now that the changing workplace environment also contributes to stress, mental health effects, chronic diseases, and other impacts on population health and well-being. So previously we had occupational health and safety, and then also health promotion and disease prevention efforts that sort of functioned separately. But now because of this changing workforce and the resulting adverse health outcomes, we wanna show the importance and the need for more comprehensive programs. Uh, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, also known as NIOSH, has created an approach that examines the policies, programs, and practices that integrate protection from work-related safety and health hazards with promotion of injury and illness prevention efforts, 
to advance to worker well-being. It's important to first point out that work is actually a social determinant, determinant of health. Um, factors such as wages, work hours, workload, interactions with coworkers and supervisors, and access to paid leave all impact the well-being of workers, their families, and their communities. So the total worker health approach brings together all aspects of work through an integrated interventions that collectively address worker safety, health, and well-being. Their long-term vision is to protect the safety and health of workers and advance their well-being by creating safer and healthier work. The, worker, the total worker health approach addresses the health, safety, and well-being of workers. As many of you may know, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The term occupational safety and health standard means a standard which requires conditions or the adoption or use of one or more practices, means, methods, operations, or processes reasonably necessary or appropriate to provide a safe or healthful, healthful employment and places of employment. And what we'll be talking about today is well-being. And this is how people perceive that their lives are going well. This is often defined through health-related quality of life. And I'll talk a little bit more about this and how to measure this in a little while. To dive a little deeper into well-being, well-being is used to tell us how people perceive their life is going from their own perspective. And it's typically associated with their self perceived health, how healthy that they, they just think they're, they are, their longevity of their life, their health behaviors, if they suffer from any mental or physical illness, their social connectedness, um, how productive they are within their day at their workplace, at home, et cetera, and also factors in the physical and social environment. So now that you know what total worker health is and how we define well-being, why is this up and coming study interested in examining well-being among firefighters? Well, we know that firefighters suffer from a disproportionate number of occupational related physical and health ailments. And to start, um, I love presenting this picture like this because I think it really shows, you know, what is expected among the fire service and then also what is the, you know, what, what's really going on. So contrary to popular belief in these calendar really fit and cut firefighters that pose with puppies for the, for the firefighter calendar, they're less and less looking like this and more like the men at the bottom of, of your screen. The prevalence of overweight and obese firefighters exceeds those of the US population and about 80%, excuse me, of the sampled firefighter workforce falls into either the overweight or obese um, weight range. And I know that all of you are probably thinking, well, if firefighters are categorized like this because of BMI, maybe it's because they're just so strong and muscle weighs more than fat. So their BMI categorizing them as overweight or obese is incorrect. Well, actually the false positive obesity misclassification is low. BMI misclassified obesity by about 10% in comparison to obesity determined by waist circumference and BMI misclassified obesity by about 3% in comparison to body fat percentage. There was another study that found that 8% of non-obese participants defined by body fat percentage and 9% defined by waist circumference standards were identified as obese, which are false positives through BMI. There was one study that found that the prevalence of total overweight and obesity was significantly higher by BMI than these other two measures, but this is just one study. Um, regardless whether BMI is correct in predicting which weight category a firefighter falls into, BMI has been shown to be useful for other purposes, sort of as a screening tool for general health and duty fitness status. Um, among male firefighters, there's been found to be an inverse correlation between BMI and systolic and diastolic blood pressure, VO2 max, and total cholesterol. There's also been found to be significant differences among the BMI category groups for most cardiovascular disease risk factors. Um, body composition, specifically defined by BMI category, may serve as an effect modifier for the association between sleep and injury among on-duty male career firefighters. And just to sum up obesity, obese firefighters had the highest cardiovascular disease risk profiles across all three adiposity measures, that's BMI, waist circumference, and percent body fat. So whether they're measured by either of those, those with higher, that categorize as obese, also have high cardiovascular disease risk profiles. 
Several uh, chronic health conditions are also well documented within the firefighter workforce. These include high rates of cancer, sleep disorders, psychological stress, musculoskeletal disorders, and cardiovascular disease. More specifically, in 2019, 60,825 firefighter injuries occurred in the line of duty, which is actually a 4% increase from 2018. I'm not sure what the 2020 um, numbers look like yet. And overexertion or strain and sprains were the cause of about 30% of reported fire-related firefighter injuries. Firefighting as an occupation conveys about a 15% increase in the risk of death from cancer. And a review and meta-analysis of cancer incidents and mortality in firefighters found a significant association between firefighting and bladder cancer, brain, CNS, colorectal, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, skin melanoma, prostate, and testicular cancers. Given the trauma witnessed on the job, firefighters are at an increased risk for post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and heavy drinking. Also, um, a new study by uh, Dr. Sarah Janke re reported that repeated exposure to trauma is likely related to mental health outcomes and general well-being of firefighters. Additional health risks firefighters and EMS workers face include cardiovascular disease, which accounts for 45% of on-duty fatalities. In addition, firefighters and EMS workers are medical first responders and are at an increased risk to being exposed to, to diseases such as COVID-19. Though firefighters and EMS workers experience these many health risks, how they perceive their life is unknown. The attribute that may best encompass this general feeling or satisfaction of life, even though they have all of these health risks, may be categorized or classified, defined as well-being. The number of health risks firefighters face may lead to questions like, how do firefighters perceive their life is going? Do they actually you know, feel like they're at high risk for these? Is it stressful for them? Do they have adequate um, psychological help if they feel stressed, et cetera? Um, the total worker health model for well-being at work expresses the importance for having increased employee involvement in worksite health programs. So it's very important to learn to define well-being from their own perspective. You know, similar to um, community-based participatory research, where you use the community members to sort of define the problem and get their feedback to really understand how it is, you know, from the members of that population. This should also be done within the occupational setting. It's important to learn from the workers themselves how they can define their well being. And though the scientific literature has advanced the characterization of health risks, all the ones that I just went over, there's been no development of defining and identifying factors of well being specifically among firefighters. So I just talked about these other facets of well-being that you know, are, are said to play a role in defining well-being, such as self-perceived health, longevity, health behaviors, et cetera. But if, is this also relevant to firefighters? We don't know. So in order to address this, we have proposed a cross-sectional descriptive exploratory study where we plan to define and operationalize well-being of firefighters from the perspective of the firefighters and EMS workers themselves. After recruitment efforts, participants will be asked to complete a basic sociodemographic survey that will also ask some simple questions about well being. These questions of well being will come from a validated survey instrument from the World Health Organization. And this one was chosen actually because um, about, it asks questions about life satisfaction from a variety of domains, such as the physical, um, qual like your physical domain, your psychological, your level of independence, your social relationships the environment in which you live or work at, and then also your spirituality, religion, and personal beliefs. Then focus groups and key informant interviews will be arranged with groups of firefighters from the chosen department, and this will be either done via Zoom or um, at the, a given location given you know COVID guidelines at, at the moment. So let me move your faces. Um, Here's an example of what our focus group might look like. Um, it's designed to first ask participants how they'll define what well-being. And then as the interview goes, we wanna focus on more specific factors that are relevant to firefighters. So at first you can see at the top here, we have defining well-being. We'll ask questions like, how would you define well-being? 
how would you recognize someone that has good well-being? How does well-being to a firefighter different than you know an office worker? And then um, the total worker health approach, you know, also I mentioned at the beginning, focuses heavily on programs, practices, and policies that are present in you know the occupation. So these are also questions that we'll ask when we want to learn a little bit more about the organizational factors that impact well-being. We'll ask what are the policies that might you know contribute or prohibit you and your department from gaining a, a higher well-being. Who in your department encourages you to have a better well-being? How does your department as a whole help you achieve a better well-being? And then we'll move into social, uh, social cultural, and co-worker factors. Um, being a firefighter, you know the the culture is very strong among you know people live the firefighters live typically at their firehouse and the, the culture is very important. So we want to ask also ask them questions about this. How do your coworkers influence your well-being? What do you do to encourage others to have a better well-being? Then we also ask questions on physical and psychological factors. These are sort of the same. What do these mean to you? How do you know you have a good physical or psychological well-being? And what are some things that may hinder or promote you from having these types of well-being? So then um, after focus groups, themes that appear most frequently will be grouped to identify which concepts from each sector influence firefighter well-being the most. Then we'll examine how the participant answers from focus groups differ from those of the World Health Organization survey. And this will just help to determine if these types of surveys really capture what, what well-being means to a firefighter. A conceptual model of firefighter and EMS worker well-being will then be described and proposed from the identified well-being themes collected. This conceptual model can be used as a tool to frame the construct firefighter and EMS worker well-being. I put here, I'm sorry, I missed the citation. This is from the National Academy of Medicine. These are factors affecting clinician well-being and resilience. And you can see here that there are all these different factors, external factors and individual factors. If I was a occupational health professional learning or wanting to make an intervention for clinician well-being, and I only wanted to focus on one specific factor, I can look here and let's say I want to address organizational factors. Now I'll know that my intervention should focus on bureaucracy, on congruent organizational mission and values between the clinician and the hospital, culture, leadership, and staff engagement, et cetera. So we want to create some type of um, conceptual model just like this. So if uh, public health professionals want to create an intervention. It's a little bit more focused to things that matter to firefighters, and it's more targeted approach instead of just you know a general worksite wellness program. And um, that is it. If you have any questions, I'd love to take them. Again, thank you for your time and allowing me to share this work with you all. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, Terrific job. So this is a good spot to maybe open it up, particularly to our firefighter colleagues that are um, on the webinar to ask questions about this proposed research project to undertake well-being. Um, I, I wanted to say before others um, start jumping in questions that, um, you know, this is a very difficult topic to sort of operationalize with any type of worker group. And traditionally, occupational health and safety has really focused a lot on individual exposures, you know, protect our firefighters from being exposed to X, Y, and Z. And the total worker health approach is really taking a step back and looking at the 37,000 foot view of how the organization runs sort of um, organizational policies, programs and practices that ultimately impact the hazards that they're exposed to the illness and the injury rates that we see in the workforce. And more to that, the prevention aspect. So how can we use an individual's well-being um, to inform how they perceive their time at work uh, with their colleagues, with their supervisors and the communities that they serve. And so your feedback here is really important to us because it allows us to sort of understand how um, this model can be adapted specific to the fire service. We don't wanna really use a cookie cutter uh, model of well-being where we know that different aspects of how um, the fire service runs and addresses um, you know, activities it does that can impact it. Um, so we want to just take a few minutes maybe to get some feedback, comments, or questions from um, the folks on the call or the webinar to, to, to explore your thoughts on this project as Hannah um, matures it and gets it ready to go out into the field.
And so I'm looking over at the Q&A, um, and I guess, Hannah, one of the first questions that are asked um, is from our one of our FCI um, colleagues, and it's how will you be recruiting uh, study participants for this project? Well, um, we have a working relationship with many fire departments already in South Florida, just from some of our previous studies. Um, so, you know, asking the the leaders of that department if they were interested at first, and then, you know, kind of going from there. Um, I don't think it will be a, a problem for us, I'm hoping. How would you handle a uh, response by So if all the fire departments, um, you know, that respond that want to be part of it might actually be those that have good well-being, um, how would you go about sort of identifying or encouraging others that are um, maybe not as uh, forthcoming and wanting to contribute? That's a good question. Maybe I just ask if I could present this, this present presentation to them again and express to them that maybe it's a little bit more than what they would perceive, you know, maybe they think of well being in one way, but well being can de be defined in multiple ways and therefore, you know, addressing all of them and talking about them might be important for their future for their health. Okay, yeah, I, I agree. Right, that makes sense. Any other questions from uh, our colleagues on the on the uh, webinar. Hannah, so, just uh, talking about um, recruitment, are you looking to stay in Florida? Are you looking to get a national sample? Yeah, just South Florida. Well, actually, I mean, I think at first we planned South Florida, but now that things are all on Zoom, you know, it's a possibility to open this to across the nation. Yeah, because I mean, just, you know, from the work we've done across, you know, the country, you can see that there's a lot of different habits in different parts of the country and where wellness may be important in certain areas, they may not be important in other areas. So I think it's, if it's possible to do a national sample, I, I think you should go for it. Okay, thanks for your feedback. In, a, in your review of sort of preparing and looking at all the different constructs of, of well-being, including this one that comes from the total worker health approach, are there elements that are similar, like that have sort of overlap between those existing uh, sort of well-being constructs? Um, or do you find a lot of variation in terms of uh, what others have conceptualized as, uh, as well-being? I found that all of them are pretty similar and all of them look at quality of life. That's how they define it. It's quality, how people perceive their quality of life. And majority of them look at the similar domains, physical, psychological, social, um, and maybe that's it. But at least those, those three or four are always, um, I've found to be always present in those different validated surveys and questionnaires. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. Usually, how people like can, um, may identify like unique domains, right, to quality of life or well-being. It, it'll be really interesting <laughs> to see your results um, and what you find. Bless you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from um, our colleagues or firefighters on the webinar? Um, okay, so it says, it seems that all these studies were for, uh, very good point, whoever you are. <laughs> it seems that all these studies were for male firefighters. Will your study include female firefighters? Do you, um, and do you think well-being will be defined differently between male and female firefighters? I do, and I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, I found in most of these studies, because there are not, you know, there are very few women firefighters, they're often excluded from analysis because they only get two or three women. And then whoever does the study decides to, to remove them from the analysis. So I think that it's very important to include them because I think it's not only just like a vulnerable population, you know, and there's so few women who don't get their voice heard in firefighter research. Um, I think that there will be strong differences between well-being because I think, um, I don't know, I, I think that there, there, I think that there will be, but that's just my, my bias. I really have no reason. It's just my opinion. And I wonder if I can ask you as also some of our qualitative researchers in the FCI as well, like in your experience, I'm an epidemiologist. So I love number crunching more than, um, you know, certain other types of sciences. So I'm, I'm, I would really welcome the feedback about how um, when doing these interviews with the population, if there are distinctions between well-being between men and women, firefighters, do, when you do an interview, do you do them together? Like, do you, is it okay to mix both the men and the women firefighters when trying to ascertain well-being? Um, or uh, is it best to sort of interview them separately? I would say that's a good question and I'm not sure. Maybe an, you know, maybe an key informant interview might be 
good to do between the like separately and then from there do focus groups together you know i'm not maybe someone else can chime in on this yeah we'll pick on dr sally since she's a qualitative um, <laughs> yeah, I was um, expert but before you answer dr sally i wanted to see if any of our firefighters also have any thoughts um you know who are in the trenches working side by side with each other if there are differences and if you think that you would receive response differences if the interviews were done separately between men and women firefighters or if they were interviewed simultaneously within the focus group. But go ahead, Dr. Sai, what do you what do you think? I think um, being that you're, you're gonna be asking questions about well-being and health, I think you would get more honest answers if they were in distinct groups based on gender, just because um, I think you know women will feel more comfortable and men for that matter will feel more comfortable talking about specific um, health concerns. Um, but we've, we've done both. We've done focus groups with men and women combined firefighters and separately. Um, and I just think if, if you're going to talk about how they may be more likely to talk about their personal health concerns. Um, but if you're talking just about safety and the fire service and things like that, um, it, they've been pretty open when they're, when they're in a group together. Yeah, I guess similarly, it would be also like if you have um, sort of senior leadership in the focus group versus um, more of the entry level firefighter there that you might receive different responses on their quality of life or, um, you know, coworker support, which ultimately may influence like, you know, their construct of well being. Um, as well, because I know, like, you know, if your boss is in the room, your chances of you wanted to say what's what you really feel might be very different than if the chief is not in the room, um, you know, the captain or the lieutenant. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, any other questions or comments from our attendees? Okay, hearing or seeing as none. Um, I want to thank you again, Hannah. Um, uh, for for presenting this today, we're really excited about this work. Um, you know that really ties in a lot of our cancer research together, um, and, and particularly in its application of this uh, total worker health approach. Um, so I'll turn it over uh, to Cynthia to uh, close up. Great, thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much to the presenters and of course our PIs as always um, for providing that. Uh, we wanted to invite you to our next seminar, uh, which is going to be Tuesday, February twenty third at noon. Um, so through May, our seminar series will continue on Tuesdays at noon. It's the fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, and please don't forget to follow us on social where you'll get um, updates, um, a little bit of info about the presentations, and then also, you know, what we're doing um, and links. All of our seminars um, have been recorded and they are available on our Sylvester YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, under the playlist, the Firefighter Cancer Initiative has a playlist that has um, all of our, our videos, all of our seminars recorded. Um, thank you so much for joining and I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.